Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and I just thought I'd do a quick reminder if you're new to the channel that all the information you will always need is in the description below. You'll find uh, links to my guests' websites, their books, etc, etc and you'll find links for how you can support World War II TV either via YouTube membership or if you prefer and I prefer the Patreon system so you can help me bring you more content. Anyway, after a very popular myth show appearance a few weeks ago, Jack is back to tell us all about the Allied use of tanks at Imphal, Kahima and beyond jack's book forgotten army is going to be out very very soon he may even tell us something about it today we will hold that thought i'll bring him in now good evening jack how are you today yeah i'm very very good thank you paul thank you again for having me on absolute honor well it's it's great to have you back and uh so you, as i said there in the top of the show you 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 outperformed yourself last time people were very interested in the idea of tanks there and so well we'll kind of go straight into it really so folks what we'll do is we'll do big kind of thematic questions at the end of the show tonight like big questions about burma perhaps as a as a, as a campaign but if you've got specific questions about what's on screen with the slides we'll kind of deal with them as we go along but anyway i'll hand it over to jack he's he's in charge of the powerpoint i will sit back and learn all about armored fist and uh and hopefully we'll learn how to distinguish grants and lees because i've never known that jack if you can sort that one thing out for me after 55 years on that planet that would be really cool yes yeah i've, that, I've actually got a whole a whole little bit for it just for everyone to finally uh, work out the difference you know obviously famously everyone you know when you read a book about this what you always find is people put in lee slash grant no one yeah. ever knows <laughs> no, like yeah. every everyone just puts that sort of compromise in um so, yeah, what I thought we'd look at to do is um, we'll do Infar first and then we'll do the Battle of Kahima the second time around. Um, only because I just feel like it. That's, that's the order that I've done it in the book. You know, I can't actually remember why I thought I'd do it that way, but I just like it that way around. Um, so I'm going to be quite mappy for quite a few times on this. You know, I hope people like their maps. We love maps. Okay. Um, <laughs> so here I've got the map for uh, the opening of the Battle of Infar. So for those that don't know much about the Battle of Infar, and apologies if uh, you know, you've heard this kind of thing uh, before a million times, um, what's happened in the Burma campaign so far is that the uh, British and Indian army were pushed all the way back into India in 1942, uh, and Infar was kind of like the, the, the forward base that was sort of left over. Um, closest to Burma, the physically closest part that the British have a, a, an important base uh, near the Burmese border. Now, there are um, the Arakan campaigns, which we're not actually talking about today, although they are very, very important. And the Battle of the Admin Box is obviously also really important to, to this battle as well. But we're not we're not going to really uh, uh, focus on that today. Um, so what the Japanese here are trying to do is they're doing a couple of different things. The big one is that they want to try and obviously stop the British ever coming into Burma. So they know the British and the Indian army are going to come eventually. And so if they capture Imphal, that should put that off even more. But also, if they can push into India proper through the mountains that Imphal is sort of right in the middle of, they might be able to sort of ferment an Indian nationalist uprising. Now, this is not, you know, this is not impossible. You know, there's the... the um, Bengal famine has been going on, you know, the Indian nationalist movement has been going on for a long time at this point. So it's not a, a, a necessarily bad idea from Mutaguchi Renya, who's the um, general that's in charge of the entire operation. So that's sort of the intention with the Battle of Enfal and also Kohima. The plan itself is essentially, if you can see on the map there, the blue lines of the Japanese is they're going to try and envelop Imphal from multiple different sides, and they're also going to send a force north to Kohima as well. Now, it's the 31st Division going north to Kohima. It's the 15th Division that's in the middle of those blue lines attacking uh, Imphal from the north, and then it's the 33rd Division attacking from the south. Um, and essentially, it's to envelop them, and then hopefully what they're going the British will do is they'll try to escape encirclement. That's everything that they did during 1942, and the British will run away, the Indians will run away, the Japanese will capture all of the food and supplies that they need, uh, and then crack on to India. Now, obviously, the speed is really important there. They need to do this in advance quickly. So they only take 20 days of rations, fully assuming that the British are going and the Indian army are going to flee like they did all the way through 1942. So what they're hoping uh, is one thing. But obviously, Slim has been in charge for nearly a year at this point. So he's, he, you know, he has changed the army. He has turned it around. It's, it, by now, it's been renamed 14th Army. It used to be Eastern Army up until the sort of the disasters in the uh, Arakan. 
Um, and the biggest change that they've made is that they now will, if they are attacked and if they're encircled, they don't try and break out and they will use air power to resupply their forces. The thing is they've still got to then win whatever battle it is that they intend to fight. Um, and that's really what we're going to look at today. So once they're completely surrounded here, what they're going to do is uh, fight their way out of this by destroying the Japanese where they find them. And now this is really important to sort of my overall sort of ideas about armour, you know, why this is about um, my slightly dramatic title, uh, Armoured Fist, um, how the tank, how tanks defeated the, the invasion of India. It's simply because when the uh, Japanese make this invasion, Slim is deliberately withdrawing his troops, you know, over 100 miles from the south at Tidham, in the bottom left corner of the left-hand map. Mm -hmm. Now, he draws the 17th Division all the way up the Tidham Road, back to Imphal, which is a plane, which, again, on my previous appearance, we talked a little bit about this. The plane is where he can use his advantages of artillery, tanks, um, and, and air power as well to defeat the Japanese and, and to, to destroy the Japanese, frankly, on a ground of his own choosing rather than the Japanese attacking his men in the mountains. So let's look at some of the actual examples uh, of what took place during the battle. So um, I've done this. This is, you know, I like Google Earth. You know, one of the things that I've been, took it, uh, been looking at with my publishers is perhaps having a link or a QR code because I've, I've made a map um, on Google Earth of all the different places that are important throughout the entirety of the book and having the, the QR code, someone with a phone could scan that and open it up. But it's um, <laughs> it's proving cha more challenging than we realise to just put a link in a book. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so this is the Infar plane. And the reason why I love this so much is because you can really get a sense of what I mean by it. it's a plane. It's a big, I mean, technically it's a valley, technically. Um, but everyone called it a plane at the time. It's about 45 miles long, 25 mile, miles wide. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, Norma, you need, your spe you need your specs. I know I was worried about that when I, when I put this on here. That's why I put some of the, the big... Depends what size screen on. you're watching on. If you're watching oh, on yeah, a phone, that's... it's very different. If you're watching on a big 60-inch TV, as some do, it's fine. <laughs> so, uh... <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so you can see that the mountains are on either side. Now, we're talking about mountains that, you know, almost every single one of those is at least a 1,000 feet above the floor of the... Um, the floor of the actual plane itself. Um, so you can see this is roughly north, north, south. Uh, sorry, we're, we're looking from the south, looking north. So Kahima is to the north, Silchar is to the um, west, Tamu to the east, and Burma as well, uh, and Tidim to the south. And I've put um, the squadrons of a couple of the different regiments on the um, uh, on the map as well, using little widgets that show if they're in Lees or Stuarts. Now, I wasn't sure how well that would show up, so hopefully it shows up well enough. So you have uh, C Squadron at the top left there at a place called Kangla Tongbi. You've got B Squadron. Um, they're sort of to the top right of Imphal uh, in their own little um, their own little defensive box up there. And then you've got A Squadron are actually off the screen, technically. They're in the Cable Valley on the 15th of March, 1944. Um, the Cable Valley being sort of like the last valley before the, um, or just, sorry, just over the border into Burma. Um, sort of the first river that you come across, uh, sorry, the first valley that you come across. Um, so they've been working their way down there. They moved there in great secrecy uh, just before, like at the end of February. Because, again, this is the thing that's um, worth mentioning is that Slim is about to start an offensive in this area. He's planning to send them a limited offensive across. Um, there are, so I've just seen someone ask how many tanks in a squad. So there's, in a troop, there are three tanks. Um, so there'll be like the troop commander plus two more, and they'll they might move ahead in a um triangle formation, for example, when they're moving forwards, um, if they're not on like a narrow road or something. So uh, that's the disposition at the bottom left. You've also got a squadron of the uh seventh light cavalry in Stuart tanks, and they're the first unit that I really want to um quickly mention. So when the battle starts, it comes a week earlier than Slim was expecting. He was expecting actually had a week longer before he'd have to, um, you know, when he finds out about the Japanese invasion, uh, he thinks he's got another week when he sort of sees the movements of Japanese troops on the far side of, of the frontier. Um, and he wants to bring all of his divisions back into Imphal, as I say, but he wants to time it just right. He doesn't want to just pull them back. 
He wants to make the Japanese fight every inch of those, um, uh, every single inch of that retreat back into Imphal so that the Japanese take casualties the whole way. So he time, he wants to time that with the 17th Division, who are the furthest away at Tidim itself to the far south, over 130, uh, about 130 miles off the top of my head. And they want to withdraw nice and slowly, fight the Japanese all the way in, and Slim gets it wrong. And he intends to bring them in in good time but the japanese cut the road beforehand um, and they actually managed to uh, not just cut the road but they set up a series of roadblocks and it's really really similar to 1942 the, re the retreat in 1942 a load of roadblocks and the british are going to fall back and they're going to destroy themselves on the roadblocks um but what slim does is he sends a squadron moving south to rescue them and so they then come across some of these roadblocks from the opposite side that the Japanese are expecting to face anyone. Because they're they're looking, the Japanese are setting up roadblocks looking south, waiting for the 17th Division to come to them. And then all of a sudden, they've got Stuart tanks turning up behind them. You know, remember, Stuart tanks are long. Um, you know, this is uh, March 1944. Stuart tanks are long um, obsolete in the in the Western theatres uh, for sort of frontline fighting work. You know, reconnaissance is mostly what they're used for in Europe. Um, so he's pulling them back, but then the Japanese roadblocks are being attacked from behind by these cavalry um, divisions fighting in Stuarts. And what's really important about these, these are the first Indian tank crews to fight inside the tanks. Up to this point, the only tanks that have been there have been British Army regiments, Royal Armoured Corps, uh, Royal Tank Regiment, or British um, cavalry regiments, like mechanised cavalry regiments, uh, who have, who have travelled over. The Seventh Light Cavalry are the first Indian unit to fight. So that yes, they've got British officers, they've got some uh, Indian officers, um, but they are the first Indian crews that see action in from from the periscope of a tank ascension. So they manage to break through those roadblocks and they do the same thing that happened in 1942. They escort 17th Division back out, and again they break through multiple um, roadblocks on the way back out. Uh, Jay, yes, the Stuarts are. They're, they're equal in about 1942, um, but they're probably actually better than a number of Japanese tanks, which is something that we're going to talk about, I think, with the next one. Um, so I'll move it on. So that's 7th Cavalry bringing 17th Division back into the back into the um, Imphal Plain. They settled, by the way, at Bishnapur, which you can see to the left of the lake in the bottom left-hand corner of the map. Um, let's move this on, though. So... Um, the 20th of March. Now, I've put on the Tamu Road here because that's kind of the roughly where they are. They're actually just off the Tamu Road, still in the Cable Valley when this takes place. But the Tamu Road's that a little bit more um, recognisable, I think, to people. So on the 20th of March, a squadron of the 3rd Carabiniers have been ordered to move south towards Tamu, the actual place, because that's where the 20th Division of the uh, Indian Army are based. Uh, again, about to move on into, uh, you know, cross over the Chindwin River and uh, take part in the uh, invasion of Burma that was going to happen in 1944 if it wasn't for the Japanese attacking the opposite direction. So the 20th Division are there and they're also going to be pulled back into the Imphal Plain. Um, and the, the Japanese do some of the similar things. The difference here is that the Lee tanks that we're using, and this is a picture of a Lee, although I believe at the top of my head that's actually um, in Tunisia, that one. I can't actually remember exactly when I found that image um, a couple of weeks ago. But they're bringing the, um, they're going to bring the 20th Division back with them. But on their way to getting to them, the column of um, Lee tanks of A Squadron, they drive into a clearing and then on the left-hand side, suddenly there's this bang, there's the, there's the crack of gunfire, rifle fire and, uh, from both sides of the road. And to the front left of them, which is actually the, the east of them, they are coming into an ambush of three Type 95 Japanese tanks. And I've got a picture of one on the left here, which is at the Tank Museum in Dorset, although it's in a new place. That's an older picture that's from um, before it was moved into its current location. But it is, but it is the right tank. That's a Type 95 tank. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the Japanese have done something that they do constantly. They just don't have a decent act, like a doctrine to go with their tank fighting. So these Japanese tanks, despite their potential mobility, but also despite their really thin armour, they have lined themselves up basically in a tree line 
cleverly camouflage themselves with the intention of just sitting there and then opening fire when something comes along and, and ambushing them. And what they're doing is they're therefore taking away one of the biggest strengths of a tank, its mobility. The whole point is that you've got this armoured beast, this thing that is um, impervious to small arms fire, that you can move it to where you need to and engineer opportunities. And the Japanese, have, from the moment they camouflage those tanks, they doom them because they're coming up against these Lee tanks, which have um, got armour that's thick enough to survive the Type 95's main gun. Now, the Type 95 has a 37 millimetre gun, and um, the same uh, calibre as the Stuart tank's main gun, and the same calibre as the tank uh, as the Lee tank's uh, secondary gun that you can see in the turret. Okay, they're all 37 millimetres. Even at the side, if you're more than 100 yards away, you will be lucky to get through that Lee tank's armour, okay, the side armour. It's basically impossible from the frontal armour. Now, the good thing about the Lee, the Lee tank and the Grant tank as well, this, this applies to, is that their design, which give it that really high silhouette, um, and the limited movement of the main gun, a 75 millimeter gun, it's the same gun that will go into the, that goes into the Sherman. Um, that is has a limited traverse. So when you want to target something, you move the whole tank to face it. So when the Type 95s open fire on the um, on the Lee tanks in this particular ambush on the 20th of March, the Lee tanks, you know, the armor dings on the left hand side because that's where the Type 95s are shooting from, and then the tanks literally just turn slightly to the left, they present their frontal armour, which is 51 millimetres thick, and they turn, turn them slightly to the left, and now all of a sudden the Japanese have got zero chance of, of destroying those tanks. They have one lucky shot on one of the tanks that hits um, a spare fuel tank that was a, a, a jerry can or something on the back, on the back deck, and that ignites the actual, uh, into the engine they bail out, and a couple of the, a couple of the crew are actually killed bailing out, because there is actually infantry that's opening fire on the far side of the road, and the the um the Lee tanks trust their infantry that's accompanying from them from the Northamptonshire regiment. Uh, they trust the Northamps to uh, attack the infantry to their right, whilst they engage the tanks to the left. And so the Japanese have opened fire. They've got one lucky shot, and then they the Lee tank turns on them menacingly, presents their frontal armor, which is basically um, which is basically impervious to anything the Japanese can throw at them. And then they just systematically take out two of the tanks. The third one starts to drive off towards the Lee tank and then sharply turns left. And that one gets destroyed as it's chased up the road. You know, so it's a complete shambles, to be honest, from the from the Japanese attempts here. And it just shows you the um, it just shows you the uh, poor handling of Japanese armor. And they repeat this throughout the war. You know, this is not the only ambush by Japanese tanks. Uh, by Japanese tanks that then just get destroyed the moment they've opened fire and revealed their position. You know, this happens multiple times um, in is 1944 it, and 1945. Is it true? I'm sure I've read, Jack, that there was this Japanese mindset that somehow using armour wasn't quite as noble as sort of the infantry. It was sort of a not like almost a cheating method and that they didn't really... Have you read that or am I imagining that? Yes, yeah, so, no, no, there, there is that element of that because it, it kind of takes away the ability for you to show you the sort of the sense of Bushido and the bravado that comes with that. There is that. And so it's always been a little bit of a, I mean, Cinderella service, you know, it's yeah. not where you get into, you know, if you're, if you've gone into tanks, it's because you probably weren't the, you probably weren't the best person. And to be honest, you can see that as well because, you know, these guys, you know, the, the one tank that tries to drive off <laughs> actually then still gets destroyed, but he's turned his back on his enemy. It probably actually was quite shaming to him because he turned his back together. Mm. Um, so yeah, so so that's then about you know I've included this to just show about the sort of the bad handling. This is actually the only time that the Japanese risk their tanks against British armor. You know they deliberately avoid it. You know the only other time that they use tanks again a couple months later, um, they're destroyed by Piats and they deliberately haven't been used because there were tanks there and they'd just been withdrawn because the monsoon was getting so bad. And then the Japanese tried a last last attempt. Um, anyway, let's move this on, though. So that's that's getting the 20th Division back into Imphal, which is successfully done. Um, although they don't come all the way back to the um, Imphal plane, actually. They stop at the Shenan Saddle, which is obviously the, uh, probably one of the more famous sites. But the fighting uh, around that area by the 20th Division is much more infantry focused than anywhere else. And it's also much more static. They are expected to hold the line there. Um, 
I have got a map in a couple of slides of time that will sort of show you why why that is. So um, the next thing I want to talk about is up in the north. So this is now C Squadron. And what they do is they're in control or they're sent to a place called Lion Box, which is a, a town called Kangla Tongbi. Um, and this is basically part of the really the, the sort of the supply infrastructure that's been built up at uh, Imphal. You know, the, the whole point of Imphal is that it will be a forward supply base for the invasion of Burma whenever that invasion takes place. So and it just happens that on the northern road that heads towards Kohima, so where a lot of these supplies are coming into, there is a box called line box where they're uploading all of the uh, supplies. There's also, you can see at the bottom there, Imphal main airfield. So they're physically mm -hmm. very close to each other, these two places. Although, like, as you can see from the map, Kangla Tongbi is slightly off the picture. This this is a, an Imperial War Museum um, reconnaissance photo. It just, you know, it's the closest one I could find to getting Kangla Tongbi itself. Um, and what you have there is that the Japanese immediately go for this. This is exactly the kind of thing they're doing. And the British evacuate it. They shoot up what they uh, and they burn what they can't take with them. And they retreat out of um, line box into Kangla Tongbi. And then they realise that Kangla Tongbi is probably not the best place to defend, like a wooden hutted village, you know, like they all are, you know, the wooden huts. And then they withdraw further back to a box that they make in the sort of the uh, sort of further back a place, a, a place called Sekmai, um, which is slightly better defensible, uh, called Oyster Box. And what they do is to deny the Japanese any further entry into the Imphal plain. You, know, you can see how close they are to the main airfield that is the supply line um, during the siege, the siege here. They then patrol forward in daylight every single day and fight this attritional battle to deny a line box and further entry uh, into the Imphal plain. So the Japanese go into line box. They occupy it in the night. Then the tanks of Sea Squadron, you know, men like Malcolm Connolly. I know there's a friend of the family that uh, was possibly going to be on tonight. Um, they were, uh, he would drive out every single day. And he's, sorry, he's someone that I follow in the book as well, this Malcolm Connolly. Um, they advance into line box and then get rid of that Japanese incursion. Kill, you know, 50, 60, 70 Japanese maybe. And then they withdraw back to Oyster Box for the night. You know, and that happens constantly, and there's artillery coming down from the mountains either side. It's very, very attritional, this phase. But the whole point of this is Slim wants to use his advantages against Japanese disadvantages. The Japanese don't have very good anti-tank weapons, uh, or tanks either, or those anti-tank weapons like anti-tank um, artillery that mostly kills tanks. Um, the Japanese just don't have the right ideas with those. So he uses that advantage that he has. He uses his tanks to go into these places, kill as many Japanese as possible, and then pull back to his safety and then do the same thing all over again. And kind of there's a certain element of sort of a heads being banged against brick walls here. The Japanese keep trying the same thing and the same outcome happens every single day. Um, and this goes on for most of the first month of the battle, you know, through to the end of um, uh, through to the end of April. So the next thing that sort of I'd talk about. Just a quick is question for you. Oh, um, sorry. Jack. Yeah. A couple of people asking about. Is there a specific definition for the word box? I mean, I think of it as a defensive position, but in all your research, is there some is there a doctrinal kind of definition for it? Yeah, so um box is just the phrase it's been imported from the desert, actually. It's something that um was first done during the Western Desert campaign in uh, 1940 41. Um and basically it is it is a defined thing. So you would have your it depends on the size of the formation. So you know, you've got multiple divisions. Essentially, a core is fighting at Imphal. So there are, it's like one big box, but they actually have multiple smaller boxes dotted around. And they are barbed wire, like it, where if they've got enough wire, they're building barbed wire entanglements around the outside edge of it, or they're using that to canalize them between gaps, because again, they might not have enough. Um, it's slit trenches, artillery is in the center of the box, you know, you're like your unit sized, you know, so say it's a divisional box, which they, which is what happens, they become divisional boxes. Um, they have the, uh, they have the artillery of that division in the middle of the box, there might be heavier core artillery further back in Imphal. Um, slit trenches around that, you know, barbed wire around that, you know, tank park in there, you know, and they build them around certain things. So like, uh, I mean, I'm going to I'm going to say the thing I was about to say a bit later because there is another box where there's I can describe a little bit better what I mean here about using the lie of the land to your advantage when you're building okay. a box. We'll do it later so, then. Sorry. Fine. Yeah, uh, the rest of it. The rest. Of it. Um, so yeah, Nunshigum is probably one of the most, well, probably the most famous tank action in um, 
uh, the well, second most in the whole of Burma, um, probably the most famous one in the Battle of Imphal. It's probably my favourite in um, here because it is simply an incredible feat of um, driving uh, and also a wonderful example of the sort of junior leadership. Um, so Nunshigum is important. It lies at the sort of to the top right. If I go back a couple of slides, actually, because I've labelled it, Nunshigum is just here. Okay, so it's top right, uh, top right of Imphal. It's only about five miles um, as the crow flies from Imphal. It is in easy reach of uh, artillery and that sort of thing. So um, what happens at Nunshigum? is because it's so close and it towers over in Fal and two airfields, actually, because you can see quite close. Uh, there's one airfield called Kangla Airfield, which is much closer. That's only a couple of miles away. Uh, and in Fal, Maine, in the previous photograph, um, is also probably about eight miles away. But you can see both of them from Nunchigan. So if you can get observation um, equipment up there, you, you can get artillery observers up there, you can shell those um, positions. And then you can't, like the, the British and Indian Army cannot use those airfields. And so it will contribute to starving them out. There are other airfields further south, but it's a very dangerous position. But also, you know, Slim's headquarters is in Imphal. You know, everyone is in, um, everyone is in Imphal. So it's seen as the, the, well, it is the physically closest the Japanese get to Imphal, the, ta the city itself. Um, so what they do is they take these, well, essentially what they, what they have is they have this sort of a, discussion what we're going to do when the Japanese get up there they knock a, a battalion of the JATs J-A-T JATs off the top uh, there's a little conflab at core HQ and interestingly it's the tank people that say we can get a tank up there now this is over a thousand feet off the valley floor and it's pretty tight I mean one of the eyewitnesses said it was three to one one of the guys in the tanks a three to one gradient so pre pretty pretty steep um, and they drive their tanks up there and uh, as they get up there, they first stop at a place called the Pyramid. Now, I'll put a question mark next to that because there are there are just conflicting ideas of exactly where the Pyramid is. It's, it's roughly there. It's on that left-hand spur. Um, but they meet at the southernmost of the twin bumps. They clear the first one quite easily. But when they move on to the northern bump, that's where everything starts to go wrong. And because it's so narrow up there, you know, the tanks are so – it's such a knife-edge ridge. The tanks are at real risk of – of um you know falling down the side and one of them does in fact fall down about 100 feet slips over 100 feet but it doesn't drop all the way to the valley floor luckily and it's recovered a few days later but they the, that means that the tank commanders have their heads out of the turret but not just that it's like their full torso is out because they're doing three things they are spotting for the driver who cannot see the sides because of the angle that his vision is so limited so he is making sure left a bit right a bit but also the Japanese have got their slip trenches all the way along each side of the ridgeline. And so what they're doing is there are suicide attacks, you know, um, trying to throw grenades up into the hatches. They're using the sort of pole charges, so an explosive charge on a bamboo pole. Um, and they're, you know, they're trying to do this. And the tank commanders are having to shoot at them with their Tommy guns or their pistols or throwing grenades. And one by one, they all get killed or, or wounded. You know, the, collapsing in there, you know, the regimental commander, um, you know, he's listening in on the radio and he just hears, you know, tank man wounded, tank man wounded. Um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, tank commander wounded, tank commander killed and so forth through the radio. Um, and so the whole, it grinds to a halt and then they have a little conversation back at the north, uh, the southern of the two bump, of the twin bumps. They have a little conversation and they realise there's no officers left. It's just the squadron sergeant major. Um, and a Jemadar, which is essentially the equivalent rank sergeant major, but in the Indian Army. They have a little chat and they come up with their own plan to sort of try and flank the final bump, the, the northern of the two bumps, um, and to overwhelm the position. And they do finally manage it. But it's taken, you know, it's killed. Um, there are eight tanks that go up in total. Um, it kills or wounds all eight of the tank commanders, you know, officers and a couple of sergeants as well. And it takes those the the sort of the senior NCOs that actually take the position, the most important position in the whole of the infile play. Um, okay, so uh, I'm getting conscious of time. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Paul. Oh, keep um, going. We're loving it. I'm I'm spellbound. It doesn't. I don't care. You know. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Um, so let's go on to the next part of it. Okay, so um, 
let, let's let's be clear. The Nunshigam battle is probably the most important one. The Japanese have still got quite a lot of momentum at the time that they're that this is taking place. Um, but by the time of the tenth of uh, sorry, uh, Nunshigam took place on the thirteenth of April. So on Saturday is also the anniversary. And what happens is with the um, dragoon guards today, the dragoon guards on Nunshigam Day, like they celebrate it as Nunshigam Day. Um, they have their parade and it's run by the uh, senior NCOs. Um, the officers are not um, do not run the parade as their memorial to what happened on that day. You know, um, sort of one of my, my favourite little sort of facts of how, you know, these the way that the British Army keeps these traditions and the Indian Army, they keep these traditions. These are important to them. You know, it's worth noting the Indian Army today uses a lot of the same um, battle honours that were earned in the Second World War. Um, Terry, you are skipping ahead, my friend. Okay, we will get to the tennis court. Don't you worry. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, the next thing that I want to talk about. So I've given you this map here because it's the 10th of May, 1944. Um, this is most of the way through the battle. You know, uh, the battle ends a sort of, you know, you know a middle to end of June, you know, you would say roughly. Um, and the chase out begins. Uh, so the 10th of May, the Japanese shift their emphasis. They failed at the north. OK, they're still stuck in the mountains to the east on the Tamu Road. Um, you know, they're stuck there at the Shenham Saddle. And so they now shift their focus to the Tidim Road, moving north up to where you can see. I've now moved my tank markers to surround the village of Bishnapur. Now, on the left hand side of this map, you'll see there is a C squadron. I tried to do colours, but it's not worked as well as I'd hoped. Um, the C squadron on the left, which has got like a brown a brown C, that is the 150th Regiment Royal Armoured Corps who were flown in and they took over the um, reserve tanks for Third Carabiniers. And it is important, they do a lot of risks with these tanks up in these mountains. You know, they are using them in quite a risky way and they do not have reserves. They, they cannot replace these. It's a siege and you can only get a tank. By road. I mean, there is a brilliant thing in August 19, in August 1944, they do some experiments to fly disassembled Shermans. Um, and they decide that if you disassemble a Sherman, you probably need too many planes and you'll need to have, you know, hundreds of people living at the airfield in the forward area who will need to be defended, who will need to be fed, that will just take up too much logistical space. So whilst they could theoretically fly in disassembled Sherman tanks, it's just not logistically worth it. So every tank has to be driven there. OK, um, so the 150th Regiment troops, C, C Squadron, sorry, were flown in, but they took over the 3rd Caribbean's reserve tanks. There are no reserve tanks on the Infar plane. They are all in use. Um, so what happens is the C Squadron are pushed out into the mountains on the Silchar track because the Japanese are, make, are hooking left onto the Silchar track to attack Bishnapur from that angle. And the reason Bishnapur is important is because it's on that narrow gap between the mountains and Loch Tap Lake, the lake that's um, on there. And I mentioned earlier about um, the defensive boxes. Bishnapur becomes one of those defensive boxes and they use the sort of the layout of the little village to their advantage. So Japanese, uh, sorry, um, Indian villages up here are because it's a flood. Essentially, there's a floodplain around Loch Tap Lake. Um, it. They have to build all their huts on little raised ground. They have little uh, rice paddies that have um, little earth buns, you know, between one, two, three, um, uh, one, two, three feet high, you know, in range, and little um, sort of fish ponds, which might have a six or seven foot earth bun around it. Um, and they use a dried up one of those for a mule compound. When the Japanese approach it, they turn all of these things into their own defensive features. Um, James Murphy, how many tanks? We're talking about. We're talking about 58 tanks at the beginning, but there is obviously some attrition by the end of it. And um, there's probably a, a, off the top of my head, I think there's about 45 in running order. So that's a decent, um, you know, that's a decent amount. That's a good amount. OK, um, you know, that, that rate of attrition they'd be happy with. But the difference is there's not that they don't have the reserves to necessarily replace those. They do actually end up flying out um, tank crews later in the battle to take away the, um, the strain on food and things like that. Because um, they can always fly replacement crews back in, but again, that this even goes back to the fact my um, uh, this goes back to the fact that my uh, sorry that the um, uh, that they can fly in whatever they like whenever they like. I can't remember the point I was going to make then actually, so I'm just going to move. Um, so, all the time, Jack. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, so what you have at Bishnapur first, um, so that that's where the Japanese have put their um, 
put their effort into. And so they're trying to drive up through Bishnapur to get to uh, Imphal. Um, and they take a lot of a, a squadron take quite a lot of casualties. It, again, it's quite um, attritional. The difference down here compared to say, Kangatongbi and certainly compared to, you know, on the Tidham Road, on the Tamu Road, uh, on Ninshigam is the Japanese are a more prepared for tanks on this occasion, um, and also the terrain in that area is is more suitable to anti tank defence. So because this bit is a, a floodplain. Um, you know, Kangla Tongbi is still in the foothills at the north. Nunshigam is a mountain. Tidham Road is mountainous. Tamu Road is mountainous. This is still, this is actually on the plain itself. And so when the tanks approach, the Japanese use sort of, they they try to canalise. So they they leave um, they leave certain routes sort of slightly available. And then they cover them with mines, artillery, um, and so forth. So they use things like Valentine scissor bridge layers. Uh, the Royal Engineers are laying these bridges over Chungs to, so that the British tanks can hook into the, um, you know, from the western flank of villages, places like uh, uh, Ning, Ning Tong Hook uh, and uh, Pots and Ban is the most famous. The, the uh, soldiers called Pots and Ban, Pots and Pans, because <laughs> classic British soldiers. Um, and they're using them to get over the, the scissor bridges to get over the Chungs and try to attack these from the side. But they're well covered by um, artillery. So uh, this is um, a photograph from inside Bishnapur. Um, it was called Bishampur at the time. Bishampur, sorry. Bishampur is the modern day, say. But on the bottom right is a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun. Now, in my book, I've got the description that's possibly that gun being destroyed because the... Um, uh, I can't remember if it's Arthur Freer or Malcolm Connolly off the top of my head now. He described seeing the daylight puncturing as their machine gun went through the um, the shield on the front of it. And you can see that on there. OK, um, on the left is a 75 millimeter um, mountain gun that the Japanese used, uh, but it could fire armor piercing shots. So it was often used in an anti-tank role. Neither of these guns and, and Terry also, even the 47 millimeter gun, um, they're not that effective. You know, you have to get very, very close. And, you know, and this becomes a problem in um, this becomes a problem in uh, 1945, actually, is that the Japanese have to use their tanks at such close range. They always give away their position. So they might take out one tank, but then they're completely overwhelmed by small arms fire within seconds of that first round. And then they, you know, and then that tank, that, that tank gun is lost because they have to be so physically close to do any damage to these tanks. Um, and this is why there's some attrition, because they are inside the towns and villages. They are relatively small. They're easy to conceal. Now, Bishanpur, Pots, uh, sorry, not Bishanpur, Potsungpang um, and Nintukong, they get um, pretty much flattened. You can see from the state of this. Um, and the Japanese, again, get, you know, they get slaughtered here and it repeats. But this is a much closer run thing compared to a lot of the other places. The Japanese keep pushing into these places. You know, they sometimes have to um, keep the tanks in pots and pans overnight, which is a, which is a really intense thing. They had to persuade infantry to dig their slit trenches in and around the tanks. But literally, you know, think about like, um, you know, like uh, people on the frontier in America circling the wagons. They're doing that with the tanks and, the, the you know, with a couple of like a platoon of infantry to protect them in the night. And the men sleep inside the tank. Um, you know, you know, the, and they've got uh, all of the guns loaded. They've got shots up the spout and so forth. Um, and they have to keep hammering and hammering away at this. Um, and eventually the Japanese are just exhausted. Um, there is an attempted counterattack, which is um, at this time. So one of the brigades of 17th Division, 48th Brigade, um, they actually go south. And if you look at the map on there, I don't know how clear actually it is um, a place called Torbung at the bottom left. The 48th Brigade basically go round the lake, go to Torbung and occupy it. And they do to the Japanese what the Japanese normally did to the um, British and Indian troops. They they sat on their line of supply and then dared the Japanese to attack them. And the 48th Brigade hold on for about three days, like this amazing, amazing um, fight here. And another one of those ones that kind of no one really knows about. Um, and they end up, because the attack through pots and pans gets held up, the 48th Brigade, instead of, you know, being being there waiting for the tanks to get to them, the guys at Torbang end up going north and they then crush the Japanese from the south when it should have been the other way around. You know, so, um, you know, another really good thing, maybe, you know, maybe for future research, someone someone could look into more than that. It's a fascinating fight there at Torbang. I suppose it's only a few days, perhaps, um, is the reason that I was looked into it more. Um, 
So that's Bish, um, Bish and Paul and Pots and Pans. And then we get more towards the, the end of it. Oh, sorry, this, this was just what I was saying to give you an idea. This is the kind of thing that Sea Squadron of the 150th Royal Armoured Corps are doing on the Seal Chart track. They're not getting up onto the mountains on this occasion. They're actually um, on the roads there firing up to them. Um, as the sort of the closest compromise they can get. So they've obviously identified a Japanese position over on the far side of the valley and they're engaging it. You can see the small arms, um, but in particular, the 75 millimeter gun there. Um, you know, if any of your model builders, if you're going to buy a 75, uh, sorry, if you're going to buy a Lee tank for, um, if you want to make a, an infall tank, if you're going to buy a Lee, Grant, Lee, Lee one, make sure it's the long, it's the long barreled version because right. they have the long barreled ones there. There's a couple of points um, about the artillery and things you were mentioning a minute ago, that, uh, and there's other questions I'm saving for the end. So uh, Michael Ackerman, Michael Omaha Beach Ackerman, very interesting. So there was no infantry to give efficient protection to the gun crews. They were kind of on their own. Uh, ish. There, there is, there is, in fairness, uh, Japanese um, infantry opposition. The thing is that when the British identify a Japanese position, the first thing that the British tanks are doing is they're then pumping that Japanese um, right, yeah. bunker with 75 millimeter high explosive. Now, um, there is a whole bunker busting method that was developed in um, over sort of the autumn and winter of 1943 by the 25th Dragoons who then use it uh, um, in the second Arakan campaign in uh, January 1944. They use it um, first at a place called the Tortoise uh, near Razabil, and then they use it most famously at the admin box. And basically what you do is you, you use um, artillery and air power to destroy the vegetation around a position. You then use armor pierce, uh, sorry, high explosive shells from the tank this time. So the artillery and air power then bombs nearby positions to... Um, uh, to neutralize those positions while you attack the main one. You pump it with high explosives, that, um, and then you, as the infantry get physically close to it, you know, as close as sort of 15 yards away, they then switch to armored piercing rounds, which, you know, the Japanese don't know that the next round is going to be armor piercing. Um, so they keep their heads down, but even though the shot actually isn't going to be that dangerous unless it literally hits a person. Um, and then finally, the, the, that allows the infantry to get so physically close, you know, 10, 15 yards, that when they give a signal, that could be a flare in the air, a flag, um, you know, even a smoke bomb, whatever, the tank will stop firing and then the infantry will do those final 10 yards. So there's this whole system for dealing with that infantry um, that means that kind of the moment anyone identifies themselves to the British or Indian troops, they're quite quickly neutralised. Hmm. Now, there's a little bit of chicken and egg. Do we get rid of the machine guns uh, in the bunkers first or the anti-tank guns? And that's often where the problem was during the fighting around Bishanpur and pots and pans and so forth. Because it was such an open area, both of the um, weapons, the tank and the infantry, were both sort of slightly under the cosh. Like said, this, this is the greatest level of attrition amongst the tank crews in this period, uh, in, in far. Cool. Do you want to do another question or do you want to move on? No, uh, um, we'll, we'll save them to the end. I'm, I'm, I'm hooked to everything you're saying. Just keep going. <laughs> Loving it. Yeah, cool. So um, this is a piece of footage that is probably actually from overlooking Bish and Poor. And you can see by now as well, the monsoon is well underway. So this was, you know, in the background, you can see the flooding that's going on in the rice paddies, um, which would have been like brown dust um, two months earlier, you know, six weeks earlier. Um and I've used this picture because it's such a good picture. It's actually video footage. If you search on the IWM for um, I think it's something like Gurkhas on Imphal or something like that, um, can you put the link? So um, you could put the link in. The I can add that later. Yeah, that. Sure. yeah, yeah. And um, so you can see this footage. You know, there's loads of other footage as well. This is only one small clip of it climbing up the steep incline. Um, and yes, it's very, very muddy, Lance. Um, you'll see if you watch the video footage in particular, they fitted grouses, so extra sort of fins um, to the uh, tracks to grip um, to get them up the hill. Um, now, this is actually further south. This is probably Bish and Poor uh, or above the, the area above that. However, it illustrates the next thing. So the final phase of the Battle of Imphal is actually the breakout to, to link up with the um, second division who are coming south from uh, Kahima, because that battle is over by now, um, and they're pushing south. And this is where, because of the monsoon, the Royal Engineers in particular play an even bigger role than they have done in the hill climbing. So this is where you get the famous examples of 
bulldozers will go up a hill first and then they're winching the tanks up behind them um, to then get on to the next hill feature. And they're building um, a corduroy roads, if anyone knows what I mean by corduroy road, basically log, uh, log planks of the floor like corduroy um, that they then fit to make ramps. And then they take it um, up, uh, you know, the shadow, the saddles between different hill positions. OK, and then they get them, you know, onto position, onto position, onto position. That it, and these, this is important because these hills are dominating the road to Kahima, where they want to be rescued from. Um, so by clearing the hill, they clear the road. OK, now the Japanese are also doing roadblocks on the road and the roadblocks are being destroyed in the bunker busting way that I described just now. So this kind of this two phased attack, there's one lot up on the mountains and then there's another lot on the road and they're, they're running parallel with each other. Although the road is obviously a little bit quicker. Um, and this is eventually how they meet second division on the 22nd of June. And it's um, the uh, 45th Light Cavalry of um, uh, second division, which are also in Stuarts. They come south and they meet um, the uh, third Carabiniers Lee tanks on the road. So that, that's the Battle of Imphal. Okay, I'm, I'm going to finish there uh, for that one. Okay, because I'm, again, I'm conscious of time. <laughs> because we've now got the Battle of Kahima. OK, and, and yes, Jeff, absolutely. The engineers do not get enough credit, but hopefully this next part OK, will help address that as well, because the engineers are just as crucial, if not more so, during the Battle of Kahima, uh, which happens at the same, uh, roughly the same time. OK, it fits neatly sort of slightly inside the dates for Imphal. Um, uh, so here we've got another area. Now, this is now 4000 feet above sea level. So I I'm sorry, I should have said this earlier. Nunshigum, which is a thousand feet above the Imphal plain, is three thousand eight hundred feet above sea level. The whole of this is four thousand feet above sea level. Okay, so they've already climbed to four thousand feet to get here, um, uh, and and amongst these hills. And obviously, the tennis court at DC's bungalow is by far the um, by far the main um, sort of like the main event. Okay, that happens there. But actually, they're, they're, the tanks the tanks are used quite a lot more. For one, it's tanks that get them from Dimapur, you know, and, and 149th Regiment Royal Armoured Corps are rushed into Dimapur. Um, they are able to push down through. They push through to a place called Zubza, which is where the uh, sort of the furthest the Japanese or the closest the Japanese get to Dimapur, which is another big supply base. And um, by the way, Dimapur is um, 58 square miles at the end of a railway line at the top of the Brahmaputra. Um, uh, but top of the Brahmaputra Valley, and it's the road, rail, and there's even an oil pipeline being built there as well. Um, uh, and that's where the Japanese are actually going for before then turning left and going into main, like the India proper from there. Um, now, Zubz is the closest they get. It's the second division, and, and the 149th Regiment are, are doing similar. You know, I showed you that picture of the Lee tank on a road shooting at the other side of a valley. You know, they're doing that kind of thing at Zubza and then further south until they are, they come in. And you can see on the map there, it says Dimapur, 45 miles. Um, they, they do come across that exact road uh, up towards IGH Spur. And by the time the tanks get sort of settled on IGH Spur, it's not, you know, it's only been a few days since uh, infantry had helped clear it. Um, and what they do is they get to um, they get up into the sort of the complex here. And what I've got here again, I, and, you know, I told you before, I'm a planet Earth um, nut, nut. You know, there's no better way of seeing sort of the lie of the ground without actually going there. Um, now, obviously, it's much more, much more built up than it is uh, than it was at the time. It was it was barely a village back then. It was a cluster of um, hills and huts and things like that over multiple ones. Um, but this is it in the modern day. I've chosen it specifically. Now, again, it might not be so clear to other people, but so I've labelled it with IJH Spur, but you can still see today the Naga Hospital Authority in the top left because it's still a hospital. It was it was a hospital at the time. They rebuilt the hospital. It's still a hospital now. Um, you can see at the top right DC's bungalow, which is where the um, tennis court is. That's where the um, uh, that's where the uh, sort of the main, the, the sort of the main part that we're going to focus on today, and it's where the modern day Commonwealth War Grave is. Uh, Garrison Hill, which was the centre, the, the sort of the only bit the Japanese didn't manage to capture uh, in the Battle of Kohima, in the opening bit, the siege phase, um, and that's really important to point out. Um, you know, and, and, and this was difficult in the. I found this difficult writing the book as well because it's really difficult to just gloss over. The siege of Kohima because it's such an amazing moment mm. in you know yeah. um, I can't I can't remember if it's Rob Lyman specifically who comes up with this phrase or if he if he's used it as well if it's, if it's older than that 
um, the, as like a British and Indian Thermopylae. You know, this this fifteen hundred soldiers get crushed into this tiny and tiny perimeter centered around Garrison Hill, um, and the tennis court on the northern or the, the northeastern side of Garrison Hill um, is no man's land essentially. OK, um, it's why it's so famous, because everyone can imagine the size of a tennis court. You know, we're so used to, for example, you know, um, using a football pitch, you know, oh, it's two football pitches away. It's three football pitches. You know, it's a tennis court. <laughs> you know, it's the penalty box. It's smaller than the penalty box on a football pitch. Um, apologies if people don't, uh, aren't football fans or an American, uh, if we've got any Americans listening or anything. Sorry. <laughs> a soccer pitch. Um so the um, the siege, like I said, I feel really bad skipping over this because it's such an amazing story. But my story with tanks starts after the siege and, and mm. winning a siege doesn't necessarily finish a battle. OK, you could maybe win a battle in the siege because, you know, the Japanese not capturing this position and moving on, you know, it is a big mistake. You know, um, the general here, Sato, he could have just isolated Kahima and carried on to D Dimapur. You know, Dimapur was panicking, you know, at that point. But he didn't. He chose to sit and destroy Kahima, and it was and it was his undoing, to be honest. But his men still need to be cleared off this ridge. That's the important thing. Because um, to go back one one slide, actually, the road from Dimapur, as it hooks around, you know, the whole of this sort of this complex of hills, the road that goes off to the south is the road to Imphal. It is the only road that goes to Imphal. So if the Japanese have got control of DC's bungalow at the top right. You know, and so you can see the size of a tennis court. You can get a rough, um, we well, can see 500, how long 500 yards is. You know, they are yards from that road when they occupy DC's bungalow and the area around it. Okay, and they're slightly overlooking it as well. You cannot get a sausage through to uh, Imphal. Well, you're making frankly. me hungry now. Talking about sausages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you, you cannot get a thing through to Imphal by road until you've cleared the tennis court area dc's bungalow there, there is no other way around it you can clear every single hill in the local area um as much as you like until you've got dc's bungalow you do not have control of that road okay and um, so uh, there are multiple attempts to get to it you know and there are multiple failures but um the important thing to understand is that over five weeks hundreds hundreds of people are killed um hundreds of people are killed uh, fighting over the uh, tennis court and DC's bungalow, you know, and admittedly, mostly Japanese. You know, they are frankly unimaginative tactics. They are human wave tactics to a degree, um, but they are, um, uh, you know, they are unimaginative at the end of the day. You know, and so uh, when they fail to take it in the first sort of sixteen days, the initial siege phase, Sato's decision is now: well, let's turn this into a very expensive stalemate. Um, and what we'll do is we will take as many of the British lives as possible. And then when Mutaguchi and um, the other two divisions in Fahl have won there, they'll come and help us finish the job. OK, but we'll we'll take as many, we'll kill as many of the um, Japanese as we can. Uh, sorry, as many of the British and Indian troops here as we can. Um, and when the tanks arrive, this is the point where you start to see a little bit of progress. Now, yes, hills are cleared without tanks. But the difference here, and this is kind of the major crux of my book, is casualty figures are horrible when there's no tanks. You know, you're seeing very high figures. You know, you're talking in the sort of like um, the, the 10 to 15 percent of casualties in any particular attack, which, it, which is a lot. You know, anything over 10 percent is a lot in a particular action. You know, obviously there are, you know, there are plenty of examples of attacks that are far worse, uh, including during this battle. And I'm talking from the British and Indian perspective here, you know, much higher um a much higher casualty rates than the Japanese. In fact, by the end of this battle, by the way, of all of the troops that invaded India, the casualty rate in the um, <clears throat> in the Japanese combat arms is 81% casualties, most of whom are killed. 81% of the combat troops. Like, it's incredible. Um, so, anyway, um, they do try multiple ways of getting tanks up there. So, um, we talked about the... Uh, oh, before I move on any further, I, was, I promised you the difference between Lees and Grants, because... The Lees are being used by the um, the Lees are being used by the Third Carabiniers further south, but the 149th um, Royal Armoured Corps, who has just been shipped into India a few months before, 
they've got the slightly newer kit. They've got the Grant tank. Now, the main difference between these two tanks is the crew and the turret. OK, so the Lee on the left hand side and I've circled in red the location of the um, uh, the location of the radio man who would be in the front left. If you were looking down at the front left of the tank, you know, you can see the vision port, the pistol port just above the red, the red circle. And so that would be the radio man in the Lee tank. Now, the British at the beginning of Lend Lease, when they first receive Lees, they say we don't have the manpower to have, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> Seven guys in a tank? Like, are you mad? You know, we don't have 100, 100 million people in our country. You know, we, we have got a limited number of people fighting on multiple fronts. Um, you know, the Indian Army is completely volunteer. We we need something that's a little bit better for us. Um, so they put the, a bit like with the Sherman Firefly, actually, uh, um, or the Sherman General, the radio is in the back of the turret, and they extend the turret backwards to house that radio in the smaller Lee turret to turn it into the Grant tank. OK, so um, what you'll see is all of my following photos as well. You will see are all Grant tanks um, to get an idea of the difference in the uh, the turret type. OK, so hopefully that's cleared that up for people. Yeah, if just a quick sure. question. Good. While, while we're talking about radios, we had one earlier. Uh, I've got to find it now um, from Leslie. How good were the communication between the units? So uh, if you, I mean, whether you were going to mention it anyway, but you know, tank to tank and then tanks to the headquarters. What what's the condition? What are the communications like? Yeah, well, um, all of the, the tank units are completely um, wired in, what they would call at the time netting in, the, the yeah. wireless net. They're netted in. So they've all, they've all got their yeah. um, uh, communication sorted between the tanks. Communication between tanks, absolutely fine. Their biggest problem is the, um, communication, between, um, the communication between the tanks and the infantry. So, you know, I talked earlier with the bunker busting methods using, you know, flying, firing a flare, waving a flag, whatever, to signal that they're ready to charge Japanese bunker. OK, that's kind of the, the, the most important way that they've got it. But they do also have things like they install in 1943 a radio, um, a telephone intercom on the back of the tanks. And what's really interesting is the British do this first. It's a request that they make and it then goes on all of them. But if you watch um, you know, my example for this, if anyone's not sure, is if you watch Full Metal Jacket, there is a scene at the beginning of the Battle of Wei where he uses the, the telephone intercom on the back of a tank. That's invented for um, by, by the Brit or is the British request it from American Lend Lease builds um, uh, to be put on the back of their tanks in 1943, at the beginning of 1943, because of problems communicating with them before. There are also some um, issues as well for British tank crews when uh, an Indian soldier comes to the back and they're speaking in Urdu, expecting the crew to either be Indian or Indian Army, mm. where the British, you know, to be an officer in the Indian Army, and um, you have to be, you have to be at least competent in Urdu. Mm. And if you want to get above major, you have to be fluent. Okay, if you want to be above major, uh, that does become a problem in the war as well. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so that that's the biggest problem that they have. They do eventually have radios in the tank with the infantry. They properly are able to net in with the infantry, but really that's only sorted by uh, the tail end of forty four into nineteen forty five. Nineteen forty five is perfected. Um, anyway, let's go on. So um, there were multiple attempts. And on this map, I hope you can see it, uh, where it says DC's bungalow at the top right of the map. You can yep. see sort of down to the left of it, it says ramp. OK, and um, hopefully yep. everyone can see ramp. Yep. That was built by the Royal Engineers as a way of getting a tank up there. Um, but it, um, two problems with it. It was just a little bit too steep and it's too in view of the Japanese who were on that complex. It literally came up into the heart. It was built under fire. Um, it was built under fire um, by the Royal, Royal Engineers. And they even attempted to tow the tank up there, but it just slipped back. They and um, the bulldozer actually ended up sort of partially on top of the um, uh, the Grant tank that had tried to climb uh, be, that they were trying to tow up there. Um, so they realised that they're not going to get it through there. So they're going to go round behind. And the problem is, is that you can see on the map Kuki Picket. Now that's still in the hands of the Japanese at the end of April, beginning of May. Um, and so this is probably the the most famous tank that's sort of in Burma because it's the only one that's really still there. Um, this is Major Ezra Rhodes' tank. Now, this is a brilliant, honestly, a brilliant story. And again, um, you know, when I did the research for this book, I've, I've included this in the book. Um, when I went to the National Archives, he wrote a very, very detailed report on exactly what happened moment by moment when he abandoned this tank. And, and, and it's an amazing story. OK, 
So what they've done is they've gone all the way south and they've gone through artillery fire. There's, they've lost a few tanks to mines to get all the way south to, and in fact, I'm going to go back a couple of slides um, to this one. You can see FSD at the, po at the bottom there. So the Japanese have got control of all of this apart from IGH Spur and Garrison Hill when the tanks arrived. And IGH Spur had only been in um, Allied hands for a few days when the tanks arrived. Um, so Garrison Hill is the only thing. So they've had to fight all the way around that road. And there are mines. In some places, they come under anti-tank gunfire, but it's quite long range, to be honest. So it's um, more of a nuisance than it is a problem. Um, you know, the mines are by far the biggest problem. They do lose a few tanks. And essentially what the plan is, they're going to use tanks to, to help get onto FSD and the, the one below it further south called DIS, um, which is Detail Issue, D, D I. Uh, DIS for issue, um, this hill, FSD, and then Kooky Picket. Now they take um, DIS and FSD with the help of tanks. The tanks are bunker busting on those hills. Engineers are pulling them up there, or, or they're building ramps in these two occasions. But Kooky Picket is still too strong. You know, it's that classic thing: is as people, you know, as, as the Japanese fall back on a position, like any army falling back, you're concentrating your men more and more. Um, you know, if you're if you're withdrawing properly. So they managed to take, um, sorry, so they struggled to take Kooky Picket itself. And the mistake that happens next is they decide to say, oh, well, you know what? You know, and this is a classic thing, actually. This happens in Burma all the time. Oh, one tank will make all the difference. One tank will solve my problem. The, the infantry officers are saying that all the time. Um, and, you know, Slim is a big advocate of the more you use, the fewer you lose. And this is a good example of that. Um, so they decide we're going to send... Uh, a tank round behind Kooky Picket up onto Garrison Hill because we can survive for the moment without Kooky Picket. But if we get rid of the tennis court DC's bungalow, we can, you know, that would make it easier to reinforce the attack on the other hills further south. Because kind of essentially what they're doing is here is instead of methodically moving south hill by hill, they're trying to cheat and they're trying to go round from the opposite side. But the only route is underneath the eyes of the Japanese. You know, so it's a really difficult operation for them to to try and do. Um, so Rhodes decides to go himself. He's the squadron commander. So, you know, he, he's not sent, he's not sent some, some poor like a uh, troop commander or something. He's gone himself. Um, he's pushed around behind Kooky Picket, but he's not actually gone round um, uh, with any infantry support either. Now there's a couple of tanks behind him in sort of the scratch troop that he's cobbled together because, you know, like I said, they lost a few tanks to um, mines. They lost, uh, they lost four on that day or these couple of days, they lost four to um, they lost four tanks to mines just getting round to FSD, Kooky Picket, that sort of thing. Um, so Rhodes is on his way round here to get his tank to Garrison Hill with the idea of eventually clearing the tennis court because that will make reinforcing the rest of the area even easier. Um, but as he's going round, you know, and again, uh, this is something I forgot to say now, it's May, the monsoon has started, Kahima is much higher in the mountains, it's been going for two weeks. Okay, it starts a couple of weeks earlier than it in fall because the, the there's like a microclimate. It, it rains much earlier because it's higher up and the sort of you know I'm not a weatherman, you know I'm not a geographer. You know they're doing too much colouring in most of the time. Um, so it's already very very slippery. And basically, the track that they've been told should get them to Garrison Hill is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. Um, and there's Kooky Picket to the left of them going up. OK, but then there's the drop down into the valley towards the road, the other side. OK, so they can either get stuck half like sort of go on the hill or they're going to slide down the far side. So it's so it's not in a very good position. And basically they lose control. Um, and I chose this map quite specifically. Now, unfortunately, it's probably too small. But if you look slightly to the right of Kooky Picket in very small writing, it says Kahima World War Two battle tank. OK, so that's where. Um, you know, Google has kindly labelled this tank for us. Um, so if you ever want to go there or find it, you can just Google on plant, uh, on Google Earth, Kahima World War II battle tank. You'll find it straight away. Um, and, and it's obviously this tank. And what's happened is it slid down that hill. It hits a, well, it stops for a moment. They then try to reverse backwards and then they lose it again. And it slips down a further sort of 20 feet, 30 feet. But what's happening here is they're falling deeper into a Japanese position between Kooky Picket and Garrison Hill. They're basically in the middle of the Japanese trenches. They're surrounded and the Japanese start stalking them. And there's no 
British infantry, they haven't been sent round because this is just tanks heading to Garrison Hill. You'll be all right on your own. You're only going a few hundred meters, a couple like hundred meters, two hundred meters. Um, they've so they've ended up in the middle of this thing. Now he rate like Ezra Rhodes radios quickly and apparently slightly, um, not that uh, maybe it was a bit much, but you know, forcefully telling his uh the the next tank behind him, Sergeant Brearley, to get his tank around that corner now and give him some some uh, covering fire. Because they've thrown a track, you can see it at the back that they've damaged. The, you can see the damaged track at the back, at the bottom right of that picture. Okay. Um, yes, Terry, that that is possibly quite true that they're defecating bricks, um, and it gets worse, Terry, because Ezra Rhodes, in the sort of the panic and discombobulating, because the tank has turned 180 degrees when it hits a tree on the way down, and the front end hits a tree. Um, it has uh, the Japan. Uh, he's left his turret flaps open. Okay, his flaps are open. <laughs> and what happened is, and this is honestly absolute miracles, but this is in his report from, you know, a few days or a week or two afterwards. A Japanese grenade drops down and cuts his head open. He cuts his head where the Japanese grenade drops down into the bottom of the tank um, and then explodes and doesn't hurt anyone. Like, it's, in, it's incredible. Okay. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, I scramble into open the thing. Another tank comes in, and uh, sorry, another grenade comes in, and also doesn't hurt anybody. Now, famously, the Japanese tank, uh, the Japanese grenade, um, you know, the one where you see them in films, they bang it on their head. Um, apparently, that was actually quite a, not not a very effective grenade. It's shrapnel wasn't very good. This is a really really good example of that because it, honestly, the, the the contemporary report, I promise you, nobody is hurt apart from where the grenade lands on his head. When it's the first grenade is thrown in. Um, so at this point, you know, they're they're pretty worried. The Japanese are getting closer. Sergeant Brearley is now in a position to start shooting and covering him. They destroy all the vital equipment and they basically burst out of the um the the uh all the hatches at the same time. And there's a few gunshots, but nobody um nobody actually uh is even hurt. Now, a couple of them talk about, you know, um, bullets whistling by their ears and stuff, but that's in the report as well, that, you know, full on, you know, the fizzing noise of a bullet past their ear. Um, but they managed to get away and they they escape back the way they came and then they, they walk on the road back to where that Royal Engineer ramp is uh, that I mentioned earlier. Like, like incredible that, that nobody is hurt. And, then, and they literally run like hell from the middle of a Japanese position. You know, you know, um, you know Brearley's cover fire must have been effective you know, and, and careful, clearly, um, for, for them to have safely got out. You know, an incredible moment, I think, you know, massive luck to the, to that crew, you know, six of them, you know. I mean, maybe even the fact there's six of them, there's too many targets, you know, who knows? Um, I mean, Slim certainly comments in Defeat to Victory that Japanese mark, marksmanship was poor as well. Although he also says the same about the Gurkhas. Um, unusually bad, both of them are unusually bad shots. Um OK, so the next one, this is the probably the most important thing. And again, you know, this is wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm really, really grateful because I've been in contact with this man's daughter as well. Um, so uh, this is the final battle on the tennis court. OK, so 13th of May 1944. So we're just. Um, yes, James, sorry, I have seen that he's lost contact, but it's OK. It's OK. I, we will we will soldier on. Um, so the final battle on the tennis court, 13th of May, 1944. And um, this is a picture of Jerry Waterhouse, by the way, taken um, by a news crew um, who were filming at the time. Uh, so 13th of May, 1944, Jerry Waterhouse is given the job. Um, now, he uh, drives his tank around um, behind the uh, garrison. Sorry, not behind Garrison Hill. He drives down from the... Uh, Indian General Hospital Spur, so the IGH Spur, I'll go back to it quickly. So he's driven down from the IGH Spur there to Garrison Hill this time. Again, the Royal Engineers, um, the Royal Engineers were able to build another ramp this time to that side of Garrison Hill. And this time, nobody can see it. You know, the, the Japanese don't, um, the Japanese don't uh, see the uh, tank being moved. It's in a fold in the, or so it's a, in a, a bit of dead ground on the way up that hill. OK, um, so he makes his way up to there and then uh, the night before this is uh, and him and Jeffrey White, who, who wrote a brilliant memoir called um, Straight On For Tokyo. I strongly recommend it. He wrote it immediately after the war. They can get a copy at the Dorset Museum, I think, sell it, sell a, a reasonably priced copy. 
Um, uh, he meets up with them. He meets up with a guy called Lintorn Snagger Hyatt, who's a lieutenant in the Dorsets. And the crucial thing about Hyatt is he's both occupied the slit trenches um, on the uh, British side of the tennis court, okay, the western side of the tennis court, um, and he has uh, he has been able to uh, pinpoint some of the Japanese bunkers. He's also been on night patrols across the tennis court. So he's physically been right up to the Japanese positions in the dead of night um, to try and work out where these positions are. And so what they do is Hyatt is going to sit inside the tank um, in roughly the same place that the uh, well, he, he actually sits behind the driver, but kind of leaning across from where the radio man would have been in the lee if it was a lee tank because um, there's that little bit of space in there. Um, so when it comes to the morning of the 13th, there's this big artillery bombardment um, onto the actual tennis court and DC's bungalow. So it should be said, DC's bungalow has been completely wiped off the map, apart from the um, chimney, uh, actually, um, the chimney stack from the actual building is gone. There's a few other things, and if you look very carefully on the map, there's a long tin shed. Okay, there's a water tank, and the water tank's quite important um, because that's one of the main Japanese positions. They've covered it in sandbags uh, to try and, um, you know, to, to protect it from artillery fire. Um, so what they've done is, uh, and actually it's really important, I was about to sort of get into the main fighting here. It's worth just saying I put drop, drop, drop there because this is on a um, series of terraces. So the very top terrace where the tank actually starts, and if you can see at the bottom it says the pimple, um, that was like a small hillock type thing on the top of Garris, uh, on the top of this little area. Um, and they use that to hide the tank. The tank is hidden behind that overnight uh, to the sort of the bottom left hand corner of it, where that sort of crossroads where the regimental aid post is. And the Dorsets have got a cookhouse and so on there. Um, so the uh, tank is up there ready to go. But what they're doing is they're the they have these sort of 10 to 40 foot drops everywhere I put drop down to each thing. So you've got. Um, the top part where the tank is going to come from, where there used to be a uh, clubhouse um, on the right hand side, uh, on the bottom right hand side of that that sort of area near where it says observation post. Um, you then have the tennis court on a drop below that. Then you've got some tin huts, the old servants' quarters for the old um, deputy commissioner. And then another drop down to the commissioner's bungalow itself, and then another smaller drop down to um, a garden. Now the garden. Uh, at the top right of your picture has actually been captured by a company of the Dorsets. So actually, the, the British have got a toehold on two ends of this, but the Japanese are stubborn in the middle. Like I said, the fighting goes on here for five and a bit weeks, 39 days. Um, 75 Dorsets die uh, in, this period, uh, in this period, by the way, from the day they take over to um, uh, when they finally clear it. Uh, and obviously hundreds of Japanese are killed in those five weeks, 39 days. Um, so Waterhouse gets his tank up there and uh, what they do is they get to the drop and there's a brief pause and then they they sort of he does the and um, so the driver does this thing and there's some slight confusion over who exactly the driver is actually interestingly um there's the uh there's the moment where he's right at the edge and it's a fairly steep drop it's nearly vertical and what the driver does quite cleverly is he uses the facts. And again, if any of you have been to anywhere like We Have Ways or any sort of festival where there's tanks driving around, when you first move a tank forward in first gear, it lurches upwards slightly, you know, like that. OK, um, and they use that to their advantage. They lurch it forward and then drop it. And he uses that to keep it upright in the drop down. OK, um, so they managed to do that successfully and they land directly on an unidentified japanese machine gun um position okay we uh, incredible stroke of luck you know they, they completely collapse um it and the people inside unfortunately um and what they do is then the most important position first because what's going to happen by the way is um to the bottom of the pimple d company are going to um send a couple of platoons around that way and another part of d company another platoon from d company are going to come to the left of the tank directly onto the tennis court from here. So there were these two platoons that are coming onto the um, tennis court from two different angles. But the biggest problem is the water tank that I mentioned, which if you look, if you can just see it, it's near the P of my drop on the left-hand side. Um, that completely covers the tennis court. So any movement by the by the door sits onto the tennis courts are immediately cut up by the um, water tank machine gun. 
So the first thing that happens when the tank lands on the sort of the tennis court area is Hyatt tells him, turn it right. We're going to hit that water tank right there. And they and the signal for the Dorsets to leave their trenches and attack is that the 75 millimeter will fire its first round. So they fire the first round. There's this big explosion, you know, corrugated iron sheets and sandbags fly open. You know, the water tank is destroyed. The D comp the two platoons of D Company, there's a third platoon in reserve, by the way. The two platoons of D Company make their way round. You know, the right hand company sort of below the pimple. They start clearing the, um, you know, the old bungalow, the long tin shed, the back of the water tank. The left hand company, they get onto the tennis court, cross over the tennis court. They get held up a little bit. So Hyatt sends his tanks, um, sends the tank back to the left. And he's literally going, there's a tank there. Uh, there's one there. There's one there. There's one's there. You know, um, and they take them out one by one methodically. OK, and it's kind of not a fair fight in a, in a strange way, because as they move forwards, when they identify this position, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, if they identify a position, they destroy it. You know, they pump it with 75 millimeter um, with 75 millimeter fire and, and completely destroy these positions one by one. Okay? They then get to move forward. So they get they move towards the next drop, sort of just next to the tin huts. You know, they they just they um clear the other couple of tin huts, the old servants' quarters, and they're ready to assault DC's bungalow. Um yeah, Jeff, absolutely. It's, it's a classic small unit fight. You know, it's a couple of platoons and a tank. You know, that's literally it. Um, I just want to jump in and say I am back on my phone. And well done for continuing on your own, Jack. Bloody hell, professional. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they're now onto DC's bungalow. And again, they're at another drop. But luckily, as you can see from the map, there is a, a track at this point. So it's easier to get from the tennis court to DC's bungalow than it was before. Um so they move the tank round to the left to get to DC's bungalow, um, and then they make the final assault onto DC's bungalow itself. You know, again, there's another couple of bunkers dug into sort of the foundations of what's left, um, and it's really annoyed me now because I've forgotten the guy's name, uh, Alfred Siggins. So uh, Corporal Alfred Siggins um, is one of the Dorsets who is preparing to um, use a pole charge, and when he jumps out from cover, um, he is he is hit by a uh, by a burst of machine gun fire. And Siggins is killed. Okay, but the attack continues. That DC's bungalow is then cleared, and 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 um, once they get to DC's bungalow, what people up on the pimple? I don't know if you can see it again. It says observation post, but um, people like Jeffrey White, Richard Sharp, not that one, but a guy from the BBC is up there, um, and and uh, you know other officers. There's observation people. Um, they are up there watching this whole action, and what they and someone shouts, you know, um, someone shouts. They're running, you know, the Japanese are running and Japanese are dropping down from the bungalow complex onto the actual Dimapur Imphal Road, you know, that crucial road. And they're running towards um, the northeast, heading back towards Japanese positions to the northeast. Um, and so everyone with a gun at hand starts opening, opening fire. And there are Brun, Brens and Lienfields from neighbouring positions all open fire. Uh, they call down artillery and mortars onto that that track and to the sort of the bit to the right hand side um, to the uh, eastern side and they start um, hitting Japanese as they as they're making their sort of the the last survivors are making a run for it um, and then basically the the there's a few more sort of crumps as grenades are dropped into any uh, left leftover positions you know there's a few Japanese that are found in place that are killed before they you know kill themselves or they take someone with them yeah absolutely Terry Jap Japanese don't run very often um, although this is the interesting thing, and again, this comes up in reports as well, time and time again, um, tank, and especially by 1945 in particular, the Japanese run when tanks arrive, which doesn't normally happen. And that's commented on a number of the reports going into uh, late 1944, and especially in 1945, you see it again and again, um, no Japanese running when tanks turn up. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the important thing that I'm saying here is, there are, like I said, there are 39 days of fighting here. That's 16 days of the um, 16 days of the uh, the 161st Regiment, uh, 161st uh, Brigade of Fifth um, Infantry Division, who have flown in at very short notice from Arakan, who just got there in time. You know, the Royal West Kent's being the most famous um, unit that are on the on the tennis court, you know, and I'm a, I'm a West Kent boy. I'm from um, West Kent, you know, so very, very proud of that, even though it's not te technically part of my story. Um, but the the ja uh, the Japanese end up running and being completely destroyed here. 
But what's happened is in those 16 days of the siege and then the 23 following days that the Dorsets are fighting there and hundreds and hundreds of dives, 75 Dorsets, I can't remember the West Kent's number, you know, hundreds of Japanese. And yet in 80 minutes, one tank secures the tennis court. You know, 39 days of the most horrific fighting, some of the some of the bloodiest and most intense fighting that, you know, people talk about the Battle of the Tennis Court as, you know, the worst bit of the the worst bit of the Second World War to some people, you know, and, and, and I know that that's kind of a, a slightly vacuous thing to say because there's, a, you know, it doesn't matter how it doesn't matter how bad one thing is. If, if something's bad, it's really, really bad for the person that's there. So, like, I, I get that's a little bit of a silly thing to say. But in all seriousness, after 39 days, it takes 80 minutes with one tank added into the equation. Mm. You know, one tank, like honestly incredible, you know, and Jer Jerry Waterhouse, he should have been given like a, uh, you know, he should have been awarded, you know, he didn't really get anything extra for this. Um, you know, he, he, sh he should have got like a military um, a military medal or something, you know, in all serious or, or distinguished conduct medal or something like that, um, or distinguished service medal, sorry. And, um, you know, he, he should be a household name. He should be up there with people like, um, I'll typically now I can't remember, um, Major John Howard or something, you know, to, to pick a Normandy example. You know, yeah. he, he, you know, he's that important, I think. You know, it's completely, you know, I, I'm, I've, I've been thrilled to be, it's been a real honour to be able to talk to his daughter about, about him and what he was like. Mm. You know, and I've, I've got some of his correspondence after the war and so forth. You know, real, real honour. Yeah, or, or John Frost would be another, another good person. He should be. Um, Jeff, there is our artillery support, but the problem is, is that at the ranges we're talking about, you have to stop that artillery support the moment the infantry move in, which, which I know is fairly obvious. But, um, you know, the 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 thing that's important is, is that the Japanese bunkers, you know, we're talking sort of five feet of earth, you know, in, in a strange way, you know, concrete and so forth can crack and be damaged and so forth. An earth bunker soaks up a lot of the damage from an artillery round. Um, and so they find that all but, you know, five five point five inch medium artillery, if it gets a direct hit on a bunker, can destroy it. But what's really important about that is a 5.5 inch gun is a long way away when it fires on a target. Okay? You're talking about a Japanese bunker that has three guys in it and might be two meters across, you know, two meters by two meters. A five and a half inch gun can't hit that deliberately. And then you've got the problems of logistics. If you're going to only rely on artillery, you've got to bring up so much artillery just to make sure you get enough direct hits on a really difficult to hit target. Okay, that's why the tank is so important. You know, I, you know, I make a big deal, you know, real, really big deal of this in my book, to be honest. It's the application of the tank at these tiny, tiny ranges because the Japanese are so difficult to suppress in their bunkers when they're on the defensive, which is basically the whole war from the end of uh, from the beginning of 1943. Um, or, you know, majority of it. Um, he's able to push on. Uh, they're, they're able to push them up as close as they can physically get, you know, 30 yards away so that the infantry can get to 10 feet, or, uh, sorry, 10 metres away, 10 yards away. And that makes that final assault have acceptable casualties. OK, you're not going to lose too many it seems, soldiers. It seems to me, Jack, that you have yeah. to completely um, open your mind up to the use of armour in this theatre being totally different to the use of armor elsewhere it's it's a completely it's the same tool but it's used in a totally different way it's, it's apples and oranges to compare them mm. do you know the, the thing i've compared to in, in in the book and stuff is it's more like what they envisioned in 1916-17 that the tank mm. before yeah okay it's not like well in 1945 it's going to be like 1918 ish OK, um, but certainly at this point and for, for until the end of 1944, it's more like 1916, 17 plans for tank, because obviously, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, t the tank is not quite as successful as um, people often think it is in the First World War. But, you know, I, I, te I teach it First World War at, at school quite a lot. You know, I teach a, a warfare unit to A-level and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I could do I could do a whole other stuff on, on the other channel if needed. Um, but anyway, you know, I'm here for tanks in Burma. Um, so that's the. That's the um, that's the battle of the tennis court, and obviously Waterhouse, you know, a, a real hero of mine, a real hero of mine. Mm. Um, and then the battle starts to move south. So because they've taken the tennis court, the the battle begins to open up. Now they still need to get the Japanese off positions, but as the um, as the monsoon is getting worse, it's getting harder and harder to get those tanks up those hills. And then I've got this picture here, which is from the personal collection of John Henslow, who is another, he's a Royal Engineer that's one of the characters in my book that I follow right. through the book. Um, 
this is from his personal collection. Uh, this is near Jail Hill, which is to the south of um, the maps that I've shown you, south uh, southeast of the maps that I've shown you earlier, but it's not on any of the maps. Um, and what they do by this point, because it's so difficult getting the tanks up onto the hills, what the Royal Engineers start doing is they're taking things like empty ammo boxes, filling them with sand or earth. They're taking sandbags, you know, whatever it is. They're taking those things and then they're um, installing them on. Uh, they're using them to create. Um, they're using them to create platforms that are angled up the hill. I mean, I'm making that really dramatic. Angled up the hill so they can get the tanks to the right angle to then engage the Japanese bunkers um, from the roadsides. You know, or, the, or you know, the sides of other hills. And so the Royal Engineers are the ones that's then doing that. So that second half of the battle is they're breaking out south um, to get there. Uh, and it's all people like John Hedstone. There's a brilliant story that I recount in the book where, you know, he has to go out into, you know, these um, often these um, these platforms are built in no man's land. And so he's going out into no man's land at night to build these with his sappers. And you know, Hedstone is like six foot four. And so when he says to a sergeant, like uh, an infantry sergeant, he, he doesn't say what regiment it was, um, but he says, you know, I've, how am I going? How are you going to know that it's me that's coming back? And the sergeant looks him up and down and says, I'm, "No one's going to mistake you. But if it makes you feel better, if you can whistle God Save the King' in tune, we'll let you through." <laughs> and then when he comes back, his mouth's too dry and he can't then whistle it. So he just calls out, it's the engineers coming back. And then the guy literally says to him, like, we were literally about to open fire. And, you know, like, you know, he was that close, him and his, um, uh, him and his, uh, you know, him and his uh, sappers behind him. Um, anyway, he, he's a fantastic character. I, I recommend his, his um, memoir if you can get it, Sappers in the Forgotten Army. Um, and then you have the descent from Kohima down to Imphal. And at this point, the Japanese 15th Division is broken. They are... So the thing that I've not really mentioned at this point is because the Japanese never capture Imphal, they never capture Kohima, they never capture Dimapur, they all begin to starve. They were only given 20 days of food um, to cross the mountains on the uh, 8th of March or when the first units set off the 8th of March. Um, and it's now the middle of June and they were given 20 days rations. Now, they did have mule trains coming through the mountains to get, you know, to, they did have the, these mule trains to get food to them. But they're drips and drabs. It's not enough. And Japanese soldiers are exhausted. They're starving um, and, and are broken. You know, there, there's, um, you know, there's some unseemly radio messages between Mitaguchi down in Imphal, who doesn't really understand Sato's problem. And Sato obviously doesn't understand that, you know, Mitaguchi is not in much better um, condition. Um, where basically at one point, Mitaguchi threatens Sato with court martial if he retreats from Kohima. Um, and Sato says, I'll take you down with me, you know, fine, but I'll, but I'll take you down with me. Um, if you do, you didn't give me the supplies that I needed. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't see this battle through because you wouldn't let me. Um, so the Japanese are broken and they now start pushing through to the south. And again, sort of the 149th grenade, grenade, sorry, 149th regiment of the Royal Armour Corps, they're unleashed. Um, so are the 45th Light Cavalry and Stuarts. The Japanese make a final stand at a place called Vizwima. Um, but again, that you know, again, the, the tanks are just taken into the village and they shoot the place up. And because speed is such an important thing, is when they attack Vizwima, they have an armored column that basically pushes through the outs uh, past the outskirt of the village, because knowing that the anti-tank guns and the, the Japanese units would be occupied by the attack, they send another column on ahead. So they push them sort of through the middle of the battle and, and well, on the outskirt and on the edge of the battle to make sure they make up the miles, you know, rather than letting the Japanese pull out of that town, say, and make another stand. Okay, and again, you know, like we said, 22nd of June, the 45th Light Cavalry eventually make it. Now, um, to give you an idea of the, the, the difference between them, so the 15th Division that are defending from the 2nd Division moving south, it's about 15 miles to Viswima, and then it's another 50 miles on to Imphal. Uh, sorry, another 60 miles on to Imphal. So the second division leave Kohima and they travel 65 miles in those two weeks. The third Carabiniers and fifth division who are coming north to meet them from Imphal only make eight miles in that day. The difficulties fighting in the mountains that bit further south. The fact that um, 15th Japanese division down there is not as badly um, emaciated, although it, it, they are starving, and has not been as badly, frankly, slaughtered as the um, 15th division had been uh, at Kohima. OK, um, so hence the, the sort of the, the speed, the difference in the speed between the two of them. Um, 
and that that's essentially my my story why why tank uh, why tanks defeated the invasion of india so um paul i'm happy to open up to questions well i'm i'm glad i'm back here to be able to pose them um i've been <laughs> saving a few of the ones more then what is that so um some of them go right back to the uh, the early part of the japanese but i'll go through them one at a time and then we can move on so mad cat said wasn't there dissension in the Japanese high command over attempting the invasion of India? And, and my answer to that is yes. I'm assuming you're going to say the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. So Mutaguchi is um, sort of Johnny on the spot with this. He's the guy that basically convinces them that it's worth the punt. At the very least, it will disrupt Slim's plans coming in. And, you know, the Indian nationalists, you know, the Quit India movement um, had been in 1942. You know, the British had repressed that. You know, they did lo like, um, you know, extrajudicial uh, locking up of um, Indian nationalists. You know, there is a feeling that, uh, and the Bengal famine, most obviously, there is the potential for, for um, India to, 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 to rise up. Um, and the Japanese essentially uh, go with Mutaguchi's gamble on that. Um, is essentially the point. But yeah, not everyone is convinced by it. Some people think it's a waste of time. We should hold here. We should defeat China or we should send more reinforcements into the Pacific. Okay, um, this 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 is an unnecessary distraction. Um, and you know what? They're probably not wrong. This is the biggest land defeat to date. It's only surpassed. Um, it's only surpassed by the um, land defeat in 1945 in Burma. Right. Brilliant. So two kind of on the same subject. So James Murphy was saying, how were the tanks running repairs, maintenance, refueling managed in this challenging environment? And Stuart Bertie added, did the climate have any significant effect on the tanks? So climate, temperatures, maintenance, um, a few words. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, you know, I, me being me, I've got loads I could say. <laughs> But the, the, rubber, the, the, example, the basic version, because we've got yeah, to say yeah, sorry, sorry. you talk about no, when you come book. back next time. <laughs> yeah, it's in the book as well. Um, but the uh, the main points are is that they, because they, um, so the third carabineers on um, Imphal are a good example for this. Okay, They have uh, nine detachments um, in 10 different locations during the Battle of Imphal. Okay? So they are all over the place. They don't really operate as a single cohesive unit. No, and to be honest, in most of the fighting in Burma with tanks, they don't no, no tank fights in a cohesive unit until February 1945, really. You know, it, you know because it, because it's all such close fighting. Um, so what they do is they have to parcel out the maintenance. So they um, they develop something informally where, um, and it will be later called the Advanced Workshop Detachment. Um, which will be formalised for 1945, is you just parcel off your REMI units or IUMI units, you know, the um, the Indian and Electrical Mechanical Engineers, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. They are parceled out to the different areas. They have mini bases inside the boxes. We mentioned the defensive boxes earlier. These are in there. Um, and what they would do is they then uh, do the all of the maintenance further forward than you ever would. So um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, the echelon system of um, sort of the organisation behind these regiments. Everything that would normally happen at the second echelon is pushed forward one step. OK, all of it goes forward one step. Um, and so they do. And all of the repairs, therefore, take place close to the front line. By 1945, most tanks are repaired in under 24 hours. Brilliant. That was a fantastic answer. A um, couple of people asked about did any of these particular tank crews have any experience with their tanks in North Africa or, the, or elsewhere? Well, no, frankly, most of the almost all of the tank people that fight are people that have joined up uh, since. You know, um, the the only North African experienced unit that fights in Burma is I mean, there, there's the odd person in fairness. Yeah, and yeah. one particular example I'll talk about in a moment. There is the odd person, but there are no whole units that, for example, come through. Um, the only unit that fought in North Africa that fought in Burma was the 7th Armour Brigade in 1942. And again, I, I could do a whole podcast about why tanks uh, rescued Burma. I mean, that's what Alexander thought. He's specific. Well, well let's let's get tanks, it sorted. Tanks. Well, if it wasn't for the Seventh Armoured Brigade, we wouldn't have got tanks. The, the army out of Burma is, is the word for word quote that he says. We wouldn't wow. have gone out. Um, they're the only unit that fought in North Africa. They fought a place like Fort Capuzzo, City Rezeg, um, uh, and then they're in by 1942. They're in there. The specific example of an individual, though, who I'm so you know, I'm so cross with the Imperial War Museum about this because they interviewed a man called Ralph Younger, who ended up being a major general in the army after the war. So Ralph Younger was, um, he was a uh, second in command of a squadron in North Africa. So he, uh, in the 7th Armoured Brigade, he came across to Burma, fought in the retreat. 
He then gets promoted to be uh, the second in command of the third Carabiniers in Fall. So he fights the whole of the Infall battle. He's the guy I was talking about who's on the radio listening to his squadron commander and, right. and yep. troop commanders being killed on Ninchkin. He um he is the one that uh, is um he so he fights through Infall, sorry, and then he's promoted again to be in charge of um 250 oh sorry, second in command of 255th tank brigade, who are the ones that invade Burma. Um, uh, or reconquer Burma. In particular, they're the ones that do what, I mean, I call it the thunder run to Mectila, you know, where they send this big armoured column um, racing across Burma to get to Mectila. They don't have any sort of logistical thing there, 100% supplied by air. They race across Burma, uh, across Burma to capture this particular town, and he's in command of that. He's the only senior officer that I've found who fought from uh, the retreat in 1942 to the end of the war, and I'm so cross with the Imperial War Museum because they interviewed him about mechanization in the 20s and 30s, but did they ask him about Burma? No, they did not. You know, wow. disgusting. Oh. <laughs> let's, let's send a letter to Peter Hart. It might have been his fault. Um, he'll, he'll just swear <laughs> and blame somebody else, probably. Um, yeah, well, that's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant response to that. Um, one more question on the comment. Well, the comment first. So Sean Byrne is saying uh, he's missed so much detail about this battle before on retellings that basically ended with the siege was lifted. And that's a very good point. Yeah, that so often there are there are battles that end at a kind of a collectively agreed significant moment but there in fact are other moments that followed it and morphed into something else in fact as i'm planning my monte casino series uh for, for may it, the push for rome the push beyond to other places all continues out of it it's like well the battle of monte casino is is you can define it in a certain way but there are these peripheral battles before and afterwards that are still part of the story so um so that's basically a compliment for you and then it's the questions clearly this guy knows his stuff so fred is saying any information on about the, about the fuel situation of the Type 95 tanks on the Tamu Road? Could fuel shortage contribute to the Japanese lack of tank mobility? No, they, they've only just arrived when that happens. And basically, that's literally the shortest that their supply lines are at that point. Um, they're, they're in the Cable Valley um, right at the end of the Tamu Road. If there was one place where they probably had all the logistics they needed, it was there. Um right. There, I mean, unless he's talking about on a strategic level, I'm not aware of there being a problem with their fuel, but they certainly okay. had enough of it there. They do continue to use tank. They do try tanks at Bishan Poor, but they get destroyed by Piats after British tanks had been moved further north for the drive to get to um, Kahima because the sort of time was running out. They were, and one of the things I didn't mention, the reason why it became so important to open that road to Kahima is because the the um, monsoon started. We're talking fifteen thousand yeah. uh, fifteen thousand ton shortfall. Um, uh, I think that was, I can't remember if that's per week. I think that might be per week. Um, 50,000 tons. They, what they were worried about, and they, people would start, start starving. Um, but no, Sean, the other thing, like kind of your comment, Sean, kind of reminds me about, you know, why I, why I got into the subject. This was my dissertation at my master's first. Um, and what I, uh, one of the things that I got in is when I read accounts of things like the Battle of Infold, Battle of Kahima, uh, or any battle in, in Burma, it would talk about, and then a really important hill, Nunchagum, it's really important, it overlooks the airfield, it overlooks Infal, it's the physically closest they get, um, and it was cleared by infantry with some tanks. And, and that's it. That's it in the book. And with some tanks. <laughs> you know, and, and there's so much detail, and it's so important, and it's incredible. And the same with the, the tennis court. I think the tennis court was the one that really got me. It was cleared on the 13th of May by tanks, uh, by, um, by the second Dorsets and a tank. Mm. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad that you you had that moment of annoyance that has led you to writing this book. And as if by magic, someone has asked a really pertinent question: um, Is this book out yet? Hard finding it while googling. Well, on oh, that yeah. note, um, I will put up your last slide again because give us the information, Jack. So, guys, this is an exclusive for World War Two TV. But my book, Forgotten Armor: Tank Warfare in Burma, is open for pre-orders now. Now. Yeah. They, it has gone up during the show. Um, I put it up during. Yep, it's there. I've I've got my oh, page ready to go. Okay, I'm sure I put the first order in. I'm just going to go and get my <laughs> um, CC number from the back of my debit card before I can order it. But yeah, no, um, fantastic. So there we are. Link yeah. is in the description um, below, it, folks. Yeah. Now, also the other thing to add is there is a cheeky discount if you um uh, watch if you order it during pre-ordering. Okay. Yes, yes. Now, it should be said, guys, it should be said, I didn't, um, when I, you know, when Paul and I first arranged this date, I didn't have a date for this. We yeah, didn't have exactly. a date pre-order. We held it off specifically opening pre-orders until today to, you know, 
you know, as, a, as partly a thank you to Paul and thank you to you guys for obviously supporting me so much. You know, I so, have seen a lot of these um, the comments. You know, you've been very kind to me, guys. So, folks, you know what to do to make to make Jack happy, to make the publishers happy. You've got to go out there and start punching in your details and getting this board, book out on order because you know it's it's clearly going to be a game changer for anybody who's any interest in armor and the Burma campaign and armor in the Burma campaign. So there we are. So um, we will bring things to an end. Except there's been about five yeah. requests or more for to bring you back in the future i've already said that i've got to go back and watch the bit i missed when i was frantically working out what the <laughs> hell was going on and i didn't know that you could carry on without me i, I that's my revelation it means i can go to the pub every day now i'll just wind my guest up say start talking and i can i can piss off and do something else i'm only joking folks i love being here <laughs> so there we are so um what we'll talk about obviously but what's obviously your busy professional teacher family man everything have you got another project in in the pipeline or is it too early to say uh i do have another project in the pipeline um i'm not going to say what it is yet because nothing's been signed or Does it involve green there, stuff? it's green stuff sorry? though isn't it yeah there'll be some green stuff in it yeah absolutely um, stuff. but yeah i do i do have something planned for um next year but uh, i've seen a couple of people mention yes the book will be at um we have ways fest uh, yep. if you want to to copy in cole's books to persuade them to buy some more i i'm worried their order is quite small for the amount of people that go to we have ways yeah. um you know i am speaking at we have ways fest as well so if anyone wants to tweet coles and say i'm really excited about jack's book you should make sure you have plenty in stock you know that would be uh really helpful you know it'll be Never. wonderful Never. And, and remember as well it's um it's uh first of july the book is actually released so you, right. you pre-order it now, but it's not out. You won't receive it until sort of the 1st of July. Um, yeah. And it's uh, hard, and you'll be getting it in hardback. Brilliant. Um, well, I can't wait to read it myself. I can't wait to meet Jack up, uh, meet up with Jack again at We Have Ways. And um, folks, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your fantastic questions. Didn't get to them all. Uh, I'm back at the different time tomorrow, 4 o'clock UK time. Mike Beck told to talk about the 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force. And um, and lots more coming your way. I'm scheduling shows and getting things all made ready for May. But thank you, Jack. Thank you, viewers. I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Get that book. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Bye.